Hello, everyone. Welcome to Middle Fantasy, the show where I talk about science fiction and fantasy. I am your host, Zach. And once again, I am sitting down with another fantasy creator as we have a new series just talking to people about fantasy, dragons, and everything in between. Today, I am joined by Chase Ward, who does fantasy talks, and I'm really excited to have you on. How are you doing today? I'm doing really good, Zach. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing wonderful in my little closet. It's like a thousand degrees. It's pretty much like I'm on Mordor right now, except like less people falling into lava. Or maybe, I don't know, California has always been on fire, so it still feels the same. Yeah, I was actually out there uh, about a month ago. Oh, and wow. I was in, yeah, I was in Nevada, on Lake Tahoe, so I was, you know, going back and forth between Nevada and California, and all the smoke from the wildfires was, like, hanging over the lake, like, you couldn't see from one side to the other, so that was pretty terrible and scary, but also cool. The funny thing is, is I actually live right next to where the fires were going on close enough. Oh, wow. And it was like, it was like something I, like, Mistborn, I'm like, maybe I should reread Mistborn, I'm like, yeah, second thought, maybe not. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would have been Puts you good. in the setting for sure. Oh, yeah, no, it was like perfect. Like the sun was always red. Like every morning I would wake up in my car and just have ash on it. And I'd just be like, oh, wow. Oh, no, I guess I got to start ingesting metal. Maybe I might not get metal poisoning. <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, the way this year has been going, I'm surprised I haven't snapped yet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's been it's been definitely rough. You know, I've only been out of my last job for about a month now which is, of course, why I started my channel. But I uh, finally had some free time. But this is the first time I've actually been actually staying at home the majority of my time. I was I was working at retail, so, of course, I was an essential person and uh, out there in it every day. So I didn't really feel the effects of being locked in until now. And I wouldn't even say I'm really feeling it because I'm more of a homebody anyways. But it is starting to kind of wear on you a little bit, just having to stay in all the time and not being able to go out and do things. Yeah, no, most definitely. Before the pandemic, I was just going to every event possible, just every mm-hmm. movie or just every little event I got a chance to go to. And I, I guess, like, probably we're probably in the similar boat if we started our YouTube channels probably during this quarantine to give us something to just take our mind off of uh, what's been going on. But I really, really enjoy your um, YouTube channel. Why don't you tell our listeners about what type of channel you do and the content that you make? Yeah, so it's still an evolving uh, process. Uh, it is called Fantasy Talk. So really just because I'm not that creative and I'm going to talk about fantasy mostly, but uh, I do still read a lot of sci-fi. You know, um, when I was a kid, my dad just had a big bookshelf that had Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, Ender's Game, all these different things. And then I just kind of picked up other things as I went along that were coming out when I was a kid, like Harry Potter, Aragon, stuff like that. And... So I've just always really, that's just been my foundation. I've never really liked reading things that are too similar to our actual world just because, you know, I live it and I just would rather go and read something about that's going to take me away and just do awesome stuff. It's fun and it's also can hit all these emotional beats and still have all these other settings and things that are totally different. So at Fantasy Talk, at my channel, you know, the end goal is to entertain. And so I do want to be able to review books, but I'm still learning how to do that. I don't think I'm a very good reviewer right now, but hopefully I'm improving with each video. And then the other thing too, is that you'll get just crazy stuff like skits. I just released a Mistborn stand-up skit that was really a lot of fun. And hopefully that can kind of become its own series. I've got a whole other thing of skits, some little music videos where I'm just trying to learn how to edit. So you'll just get all kinds of stuff. And it's just a lot of fun, a whole different variety of books that hopefully can reach out and be relevant to a lot of different audiences. See, that's that's wonderful. That's kind of like our goal when it comes to just talking about fantasy books. We're all in this together. We just want to talk about fantasy and talk about how awesome it can be at times. What was like the first series that really like caught you when it comes to like fantasy? Like you read it and you're just like, well, I guess I'm in it for life. Oh man, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think, you know, She Who Must Not Be Named and her series, Harry Potter, was probably what really drew me in. Um, I I think that that, yeah, it's probably Harry Potter. Like Lord of the Rings was the movies when they came out. I think I watched the movies before I ever read the books. And so I think that as well, I think both of those combined probably pulled me in. What about you? Uh, For me, I was actually, I started like doing things like when it comes to fantasy, like I grew up with, you know, the prequels. I grew up with Lord of the Rings, but I didn't really get into like reading fantasy until maybe 
Like, I would say Percy Jackson, but I wouldn't consider that... I'd, I'd call that urban fantasy, but it wasn't something that's like, I just want to read fantasy. It wasn't until I actually read um, the Night Angel trilogy by Brent Weeks that I really got into fantasy. Yeah, it's right there. You have, like, the beautiful I have, omnibus. I haven't read it yet, but I'm so excited. Yeah, I have a couple versions of it. It's uh, the newest one that I had, I had to buy because it was actually came in, I think, the same year as the, the 10th anniversary for The Name of the Wind, but it's all black. All the pages are black, and I'm just like, oh, wow. dang it. Why Why that's do you awesome. want my money? But yeah, that, mm-hmm. that's a fun series. But like, I think the, the main book that really got me into fantasy, like I can step to and point to is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss is a book that I've read. Uh, I think legally I'm obligated to say 50 times, but I think I've read it more times. Yeah, that that's funny. That's a uh, so if you see my, on my channel, I have this video where I talk about, you know, basically why I started the channel and all that kind of thing. And Basically, I read consistently from the time I was like like three or four or five, as soon as I could read, all the way until right when I graduated high school. And then just it just dropped off completely, like went to school, all this stuff happened. And so basically eight, nine years went and I just didn't read hardly anything at all, like period. And so one of the things that I did read was Name of the Wind. And I just thought it was like the most groundbreaking, crazy thing of all time. Now that's changed a little bit somewhat and it's not just because doors of stone hasn't come out yet it's more that i think it was the right book for me at the right time you know it's a coming of age story uh, i had never read fantasy of that type before and so like a whole new world like world building you know harry potter wasn't that aragon was kind of that but it was also really tropey and so this was something totally new and different so it definitely captured me his writing is beautiful and i also have the 10th anniversary of that signed by Patrick Rothfuss. I have the exact same one too. The one I got for like, when he's like, he announced it like, here, spend like 80 bucks. And I'm like, why don't you just have the sack of gold? Or I'll give yeah, you two money no, bags. He like posted it and I was like, yep, here's my bank account. And that's when I didn't have any spending money at all. Like I may have like overdrafted my bank account to get that. Well, it's also perfect because when it comes to the name of the one, at least for me, the first time that I read it was 2014. I was just out of high school going into college. So it was like, well, this is very familiar of a subject matter. And then because uh, my background is in uh, technical theater and just theater in general, I'm like, oh, man, this book was like almost slightly made for me. It's like super relevant. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. And that's like an interesting subject to talk about because for the longest time, you know, there's been whispers and just announcements about a, you know, KKC live action movie, but also a TV show with like Lin-Manuel Miranda. And one of the subjects that we're going to be talking about today is just fantasy adaptations because we live now in the golden age of streaming shows where, you know, Game of Thrones did its thing and then ran itself into the ground. And now we have, you know, other series coming out like Wheel of Time and we're getting even like Lord of the Rings for Amazon. Now, how do you feel about when it comes to fantasy adaptations? It may be a book to a movie or a book to graphic novel or, you know, any medium that it isn't just one piece. Yeah, I think that um, I think Lord of the Rings set the standard for sure. I mean, that's the best fantasy adaptation there is. Uh, Harry Potter, I thought that. So I actually I think that the first two Harry Potter movies are actually better adaptations than most of the other ones. With the exception, I think the third one is the best, and that was actually the least like the actual book. So it's kind of weird. Like I think the first two were very faithful. The third one was the least faithful, and those are actually my fir- my favorite three adaptations out of that whole series, because I think the last ones, when it comes to an adaptation for me, I'll say it this way, it's about capturing the soul of the story, and so it doesn't have to stay exactly the same. It doesn't have to keep everything in, but it has to keep the soul. So when you look at the Ender's Game adaptation completely cut the soul out of that story and it was like just whatever sci-fi visuals you want to throw up there and thank you for your money and goodbye and so i didn't really like that at all and with wheel of time you know i'm not disappointed but i really would have liked to see 10 episode seasons for that because it's so vast and massive it's gonna be impossible not to cut a ton so as long as they cut the right stuff and they keep the soul i'll be satisfied and i'm really actually encouraged by the boys which i just binge watched uh, my so girlfriend good. i just watched that over like a month yeah it took us a while because you know schedules and stuff but we finally got through the end of season two and it's just so good and i was like okay if amazon can do this i know it's a different studio but still if they can produce this then i'm so hopeful for wheel of time and lord of the rings and the boys is an interesting example for this actually if we're going to bring it up is that i think the adaptation that they made is 
far better than the source material because they can just do some insane things that aren't as graphic as the comic. But at the same time, I think it's a much better adaptation as a show than it was as a comic. And I've never read the comic, but I can definitely see where there are, even if they, if the comic is more like gory and brutal and crazy, like the things that they were doing on the boys were some of the most graphic stuff that's been shown on TV. Like that's something that like one, just one of the events in the boys on Game of Thrones would have like been the showstopper for a season. And Oh yeah. And there's like heads exploding, like all over the place. <laughs> like it's just, it was such a gleeful amount of gore. And you could say that's bad or not, but I mean, it was highly entertaining and just a really neat take on superheroes that I'd just never seen before. Yeah, most definitely, especially like when it comes to any adaptation, it's just as good as the people working on it, especially like, you know, like you said, the caption, the essence. If one person, it's like a good example, this is, did you ever watch uh, Dragon Ball Z Evolution <laughs> by chance? <sighs> I've seen like clips. And your, just, your soul is strength into your body, and that's uh, what happened yeah. to me seeing it in theaters. But, like, a good example of that is, like, when it came to the person that wrote it, actually, this is the weirdest thing, put out an apology a few years ago. Like, yeah, they just gave me this material, and I wrote something really quickly, and I had no idea what I was doing. And because of that, you know, it just became, like, a domino effect. And it's interesting now that we, we live in a world now with, like, streaming shows and very passionate people that we can, like get whole teams to just like we all love this stuff so we just want to make this crazy series i mean that's what happened with like a series of unfortunate events when they readapted it was everyone working on that was so excited to work on it and get their second chance at working like barry sonnenfeld who was originally supposed to direct the real movie of it uh got fired or let go and then he did the netflix adaptation which is a much crazier adaptation with everyone involved just working on all cylinders and that was so much fun yeah so do you so what do you do you think that we're in the like correct format now for adaptation like the eight to ten episode per you know book or two books type thing for me like i love now that with streaming shows they're almost like movie grade where you can stretch out a story the same way as like you can stretch out a book because the problem though when it comes to movies is you only have so many minutes to condense mm -hmm. into something where it can be like an absolute nightmare of what you pick and choose. Some of the greatest adaptations still take liberties, like a Fahrenheit 451. That's something that has never gotten a good adaptation, even though they keep trying to do it. Uh, other ones that I think about all the time is like Slaughterhouse Five. That's a great adaptation, uh, but it still has some things that are changed. And To Kill a Mockingbird, some of the scenes are out of order to make it flow better. And when you take one medium to another, you have to adjust. Then I think television does a really good job of being able to expand a show without it just being like so condensed that it isn't the same thing. Like I've watched the Aragon movie. I've watched a bunch of those, you know, movies that sometimes like, what is it? Like the vampire's assistant where they take the first three books and jam it into one movie. Cause they'll give them enough material to make it, but you lose the essence. And it, it's a tricky road, but I, I like the television format a lot better than a movie format, unless it's something that can be adapted really easily. Yeah, I think that for me, it depends. Like, I agree that I think that television is definitely the best way. I'm, I'm reading First Law right now or I'm finishing it. And, you know, I have not really been impressed with the plot of the first two books so far. I've loved the characters. I think Joe Abercrombie, like, is hilarious. And I, I think that's kind of the point is that the plot, like, it's supposed to be more realistic, like, not as fantastical. Like, this is almost as if this is day to day life and this, what war is actually like and all these things that grimdark is trying to do but i do think that first law i haven't finished the third book but i think it would be better as one movie actually all three books because i don't think there's i think the plot is spread out enough to where you could just have it all in one movie and it would flow better while keeping the same character beats and you could just do a two and a half to three hour movie of that and that would probably be better than stretching each book over a tv show because then you just would be too slow so it just depends on what you're working with i think yeah, most definitely. Some of them, like when I think about a book that I would love to see adapted as a movie, I'm a movie person, is The Lies of Locke Lamour. Is quintessentially, you could just take that, write it into a screenplay, pretty much beat for beat, because it just feels like a, a movie, and just put it on the screen, and it might actually work that way. You won't have to change much. No, yeah, that's that's 100% a movie. Like, I don't think that would work as a TV show, because it's too fast-paced. It's kind of like Mistborn, like where Brandon Sanderson says, like, I think this is a better as a movie than it is as a TV show. Cause I wrote it like that, like a heist movie. 
Yeah. And so the pacing of it is a movie pace and just the same way as Lies of Lockmore. In a way, it's a heist book in certain, or it's more of a scam book. Like, I don't really know. It's like fantasy con men. That's what I would put it Ocean's as. Ocean's Eleven, that kind of thing. It's like, it's built for that, for like snappy, snappy pace. And I 100% agree with you. I think that'd be a great movie. Well, especially like how like the narrative of that book is, is like, like time changes differently depending when you're reading the book. Like it would make more mm-hmm. sense on a visual medium than it would yeah. sometimes when you're reading it. Like what what's happening? But if you see visually, like oh, it all makes sense now. Well, I was going to ask you a question. So what what that hasn't been adapted yet? Are you like most excited to see adapted? Well, that would be probably like the name of the wind would be an interesting adaptation because that's a nice, interesting visual medium because it's you know fantasy, music, and a lot of other things with like this vast world where. Maybe it might not translate that good, depending on what you do, because a lot of the charm of that book is you need to read it or have it in like an oral tradition because mm-hmm. you'll miss some of those details. But the one thing that I really, really want is Stormlight Archive adapted into a big show or at least an anime format where it's just you could just go all out. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I 100% agree. And it's so strange to me that Brandon hasn't had any of his stuff adapted, but he is the most popular fantasy author working today and has had nothing adapted and i don't know if that's him being really particular and making sure that whatever gets done is good and so he's just not letting them just throw some crap together and put out like an aragon or last airbender or something like that but at the same time he does kind of create problems for himself like stormlight archive it's fine because it'd be all cg and stuff like just the sprint the magic itself, like the storm lights, the storm father, the high storms, the freaking chasm fiends, like the shard plate, the shard blades, like it's so much that he does this to himself. Like he doesn't allow things to be adapted. Although I do think Mistborn would not be that hard. It's funny that you bring it's like it's almost unadaptable, but then George R. R. Martin's like, when I'm making a song of ice and fire, because the reason why he wrote that one part was because he was like working in Hollywood and most of the screenplays Mm -hmm. and scripts that he was making, they wouldn't make because like, we can't film this. It's like, I'm going to make a series that you cannot film. And then they did it and you're like, oh. But the thing is though, I was thinking about that quote the other day and I was like, this is not that unadaptable. Like he has like a couple dragons. He's got some ice zombies. Like there's nothing really else. Like it's not, it's not that unadaptable. I mean, the faceless man, like what, what, what is in there that's, like, it's mostly political intrigue. It's more about character. Like, I feel like it's very adaptable. Well, we I see. think you have to imagine, like, being back in, like, the 90s. Like, I think it's, like, 91 that he started writing the book. This is before Jurassic Park. Like, you'd have mm-hmm. to do all that stuff practical. Like, he talks about, like, oh, the wall's, like, 900 feet tall and stuff. Like, I guess you could do, like, a matte painting and stuff. Like, oh, yeah, you just do a matte painting. Yeah. yeah. It'd you be just, like Star Trek. Like, yeah. You do stuff like that. So, it's funny. Like, he thinks that he did this, but then things transform a lot more especially when it comes mm-hmm. to stormlight it'd be it'd be interesting to see that like budgetary wise because if you watch the first season of game of thrones that is re- not, even though it's not a super low budget uh show you watch it and you compare the first big battle which is almost done off screen to the last uh episode or like the last huge battle and you're just like well this is like night and day oh yeah literally like night yeah <laughs> because you couldn't yeah. see it but the thing with the Stormlight Archive, I was just thinking, you know, is anything not really adaptable anymore? Because I was thinking, weirdly, of Detective Pikachu. Like, think of all the Pokemon and all that kind of thing. Like, there was a ton going on there visually that's just crazy and out of this world. Um, there's other examples, too, that are slipping my brain. But Stormlight Archive can 100% be adapted. Think of video games like Cyberpunk that's coming out soon and how good it looks. That's just a video game. Like, that budget is nowhere near a feature film so i feel like they could 100 percent do it it's just i wonder if there's some pushback on stormlight being like too too nerdy like what is it not accessible enough they think to like a general fan base because i think they're crazy it's funny because when you i think about this it's also like i look at like the bestseller list or even like on amazon when anytime like oathbringer was up there for months and stuff like it's like one of the highest grossing book series of all time and i think a lot of it has to do with like you're the producer and you see this a thousand page book come up on your desk and you're like oh, this could be expensive they start looking through it chasm fiends storm fathers a depressed boy i don't think we could do that for market a research depressed boy. <laughs> yeah because it's if we look back at like 
when Harry Potter came out, like the, the movies, or at least even the books, like there was this huge influx of like, you know, we need to make that Harry Potter money. So they started getting as many YA stuff as possible. And I feel like one of the reasons why a lot of things got boshed when it came to Game of Thrones is everyone was probably gearing up to make their own huge fantasy series. But then, you know, Game of Thrones ended the way that it did and nearly, you know, it, the way that it ended was like a crash and burn. And suddenly, like the pilot they were they were making for the new Game of Thrones show called Blood Moon, they canceled. Um, yeah. Days after that, they had problems with the King Killer Chronicles uh, adaptation like Sam Raimi left and then there's the Star Wars stuff and we're like in this weird limbo especially like now with like COVID-19 of like people taking risks on weird material which I mean Stormlight Archive isn't the weirdest thing I've watched like the Dark Tower that's you know out there and weird but it isn't something that's like do you, do you want to risk doing another fantasy series until maybe The Witcher was a huge success and we'll see with like Wheel of Time or even the new Lord of the Rings show yeah, I think Wheel of Time is the one that I'm looking at as like, this is going to be the um, one that really tells us if, is this going to be something going forward for the next 10 years that we're going to be pumping these out or are they going to be pumping the brakes? Because like you said, Game of Thrones, the way it ended, and we know why it ended that way is because they didn't have any source material. And same thing with King Killer. I think that's why they're probably like holding off because if he's not even... And I don't know if he, I believe that he hasn't worked on it. I think he has, but you know, she sent her, his, his editor saying that she hasn't seen a word of it yet is definitely concerning. And I don't see anybody making an adaptation of that until there's a third book out released and they see how it is because you're not going to go into another series like they did with Game of Thrones, not knowing where it's going. So Stormlight could be the same thing. I mean, maybe once he gets to his fifth book and the first Quint trilogy I, i'm bad it, it's things. like the first era i think it's like first, the first era arc. once that's wrapped up maybe yeah. they'll you know take a take a bite at it but you know there's the mistborn is sitting right there you know i even think warbreaker would be really good adapted um i think elantris is too rough like i wouldn't touch that i would do but that as a tv show or like a mini series maybe like a mini series if mistborn or warbreaker was like successful and you can say you know hey also from the same guy but elantris needs like a lot of work i thought yeah, I didn't really. It's like it. it's but a rough read. Like I read it. It's rough. Maybe a yeah. couple couple years ago, and I, I started to read it recently for something, and I'm like, uh, maybe I should wait off a little bit. It's it's a it's a fun book, but it's like, it it's rough because it's like 2005, and it's also, it's a debut novel, which you can see how good um, Brandon Sanderson throws as an author. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. Is like I read all of Mistborn and all of stormlight and they went back to elantris and that was definitely rough and warbreaker similar like you can tell his styles changed a lot but i thought warbreaker was like if elantris was polished you know it's they're yeah. also very similar books but it's also interesting when it comes to brandon sanderson because a lot of his streams recently he's kind of been talking about how he's been doing a misborn treatment and mm -hmm. how he's kind of like this is like a second chance maybe to fix some of the mistakes that i made while writing it like i want to have more females on the crew i want to have more visual elements and what do you think about this when it comes to like authors getting second chances of readapting their materials yeah i mean i think we all wish we had second chances to do a lot of things right like and i think as we especially with a lot of the social change that's going on like normalizing you know whatever it may be like transgender or you know just adding more diversity into these things like i think that's awesome like i think more authors should do that um because i mean once you publish it you're not going to go back and do like mistborn the updated version and like publish a new trilogy with all the different like you're not going to do that but if you have an opportunity when you're doing an adaptation to write your own treatment and to update based on you know us growing as a culture and as people then yeah like absolutely like i think he said docs maybe is going to be a female yeah, and ham and ham yeah perfect like why not because it's basically vin and a bunch of dudes and you know it, i think that could definitely be improved and also the other thing too is like when it comes to race like number one i don't care if it's fantasy or not like you can change the race of somebody it doesn't matter um well it does matter but it doesn't matter as far as it doesn't hurt the story but it does matter in the way that it helps you know really make people see themselves in the story but i also think that it's fantasy like if everybody on Scadrial has dark skin, 
what does it matter? Like it would almost make more sense in a way or it could. And you know what I'm saying? Like there's no barrier to doing these things and there's no reason why we shouldn't. It is the author's choice as the artist as to whether or not they do, but I fully support it. And I think more of them should. Well, I fully support it as well, especially when it comes to like making a world like the author should be the first person and then afterwards you know the weird trickle down effect of like the death of the author argument but then you have like well the author is technically a law first until they're dead and then afterwards it once you get to like public domain it becomes you know fair game but when it comes to like how authors especially now are like really thinking about when i'm making a character how do i make it and how like someone could be reading it and interpreting things is a lot more conscious than just like I'm gonna write this series with elves and like this is like a parallel for something or other, and that's just like you know you have to check off that box or you're not sure what what's happening. I think I think that's a good like it, it's going to be a conscious thing for a long time until it's just not and we've just grown to the part where it's an accepted part of our culture. You know, like I have this conversation with friends and family all the time who are maybe not as accepting or whatever, and what I'm usually telling them is like. You know, they're like, why, do, why should I have to think about this? And it's like, well, because it's not your nature yet. And it needs to be. So for right now, you do need to think about these things. And when we're making, you know, if we're making YouTube content or if we're making writing a book or a video or whatever, like you do need to be very conscious of, you know, how am I representing, you know, enough people? Am I including diversity? Am I supporting this? Because I mean, why? all things are conscious. We're humans. We think like, it's not a bad thing that it's a conscious effort. And if people are saying like, oh, they're injecting some kind of woke narrative into their story, even if they were, that's a good thing. I mean, that just means that they're paying attention to what other people they're listening and saying, hey, like this person, this group of people is saying like, hey, we don't feel represented in these stories and we want to be in them too. And then you just listen to it and you can put them in there. And that just means you're growing. Yeah, most definitely, especially when it comes to Brandon Sanderson. He's been very vocal about, like, he doesn't want to do a sequel to, like, the Rhythma Test until he gets to gets it right because he had, like, things that he wasn't comfortable about with, like, Native Americans in it. And he's even, like, apologized for, like, if I would do it over again, I would do more research. And this is why, like, I did things with, like, Stormlight Archive and, like, really did my research. And when I, I love the thing that he said with, like, Risen. I actually have a whole episode I recorded with uh good friend um, Elizabeth Dukes from the Duke and Duchess podcast. We talk all about how Brandon Sanderson does a step forward when it comes to like representation, especially within disabilities and getting like that research. And I find that to be when it comes to any adaptation, that's like a, a thing that people need to think about now, especially like when it comes to like fantasy, because fantasy isn't just medieval fantasy. There are so many different genres now. It's like you can tell so many different stories. It just doesn't have to be like, European, like wider than sour cream anymore. It just isn't that way anymore. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And I think too that we can think, you know, as a white male person, right? I can think that something is doing a good job, and then someone who is not a white male can come and say, "Hey, actually, it's not." And you know, you you can have your own thoughts and digest that or not. But like, you do need to listen and say, "Okay, this person who's." not of my same ethnicity and gen gender is saying that this is not representing this very well. And then you need to listen to that and say, okay, like just because I think it, I don't live that every day. And so I do think that, you know, research is good. It doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect, you know, because if you don't actively live a certain way or you don't have to deal with something on a day-to-day -day basis, you can do all the research in the world and still not portray it a hundred percent accurately. But the good thing is that he does try versus just being really lazy and just slapping something on a page. Yeah, and there's also like that fine line between like pandering and actually putting thought into things. Cause I've read yeah. so many series where it feels like the person's only like doing like a checkbox to get extra book sales. And it's like, you're I'm putting in the effort, but are you really? You just have a character that says, Oh, I'm I'm you know, I'm a person of color, I'm queer, but it's like you're not really putting a step forward, you're just saying it, not showing it. Yeah, it was like the kiss in um, the last Star Wars movie. Oh, the, you mean the one in the background that could easily be edited out for Chinese censors? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Like, it was like, okay, yeah, you threw us a bone, you know, thanks. But was it really meaningful? I mean, it's better than nothing, you know, but it's still not like, don't expect like congratulations and like people weeping over your generosity. You know, it's like, it was good to be in there versus not. 
but it still wasn't this giant leap forward, you know? They've definitely played it very safe, as Disney usually does. Yeah, yeah, no, most definitely. Especially, like, other adaptations that we're getting. I mean, unfortunately, Dune got pushed back, but that's another adaptation of, like, this is such a batshit insane premise and, like, sandworms and stuff. I've I've seen the David Lynch version. I've seen the Sci-Fi Channel version. And it's like, I really want to see this version and to see how how technology has met up now where you could do insane things like sandworms and have god emperors and do crazy things without really putting i mean there's effort into it but like not having to worry about it as much as focusing on the story yeah no i i'm so excited for dune like i have not actually read dune i'm i think 120 something pages in and so i've you know read the scene with the hand in the box and everything oh, yeah the gob bar even just seeing that come to life was just like blew my mind like i was like okay like that just gives me a whole like feel for this world that you know because i'll be honest with you the first 120 pages didn't like leap off the page to me as far as like it didn't like encapsulate me because it's it's kind of written like a remove like he's almost like hey you know you can't come too far into the story like there's not a ton of description it's just more like concepts and then the dialogue is really like kind of stilted and formal and you're also switching back and forth viewpoint like in a conversation so it's like an anime fight where like <laughs> you're listening to this person's thoughts and then you switch over to the other side and they're like i hope they don't know about this thing that i'm hiding and it switches back do you know what i'm talking about yeah i know and exactly. i'm like this is crazy like but so it, it definitely felt like it's like reading lord of the rings now where you feel like you're kind of removed from it a little bit but i could still tell like it's quality and i'm really excited to actually go back and finish the book but the movie bringing visuals to help me through the book, I think is going to be really awesome. Are there any like adaptations of things you are really excited for? Or are there things you wish that maybe hopefully on the horizon soon? I mean, obviously wheel of time is just going to be mind boggling. Like I'm so excited. I'm going to be so annoying when that show comes out because I'm going to be like sending it to like every family member, every friend and being like, you have to watch this as, as long as it's good. Um, but yeah, something else that there's some stuff. Hang on, let me look at my bookshelf. I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll say one book that I read recently, The Shadow of What Was Lost, I think would be super adaptable because it, I think it's actually a movie per book. I've only read the first book, but it's very fast paced and it also has a ton of twists and turns. Like you think of like M. Night Shyamalan type stuff where you're just twisting but you're not twisting just for the sake of it you know you're not just spinning around in a circle you're actually it's in the narrative it's well thought out it's foreshadowed and i thought that that book was amazing so i really would love to see a an adaptation of that and i think if wheel of time does well because that book gets compared to it so much that maybe we could see that down in the future so what about you uh for me like i said like the name of the wind i'd love stormlight um other books that i would really really like is actually so I'm actually kind of getting my wish. Like, they're doing a Percy Jackson uh, Disney Plus show, and now that Disney is focusing more on streaming services that they're having, uh, it might be a huge, bigger thing because the author's already made, like, a production company and things have been optioned out for other of his series. So I'm, like, I'm living in the year where, like, the parallel universe where it's almost like a formula. Bad movie adaptation, great TV show. Golden Compass is awful, but... His Dark Materials is fabulous. Uh, what are the other really good ones? Oh, Series of Fortune Events. The movie's okay, but the show's Well, someone would say The amazing. Watchmen. A Watchmen? Well, that's technically not like a remake. That's actually like a right, continuation. Right, it's a different thing. Yeah. Right. So d who did Artemis Fowl? Oh. Uh, was that Disney uh, Plus or is that Netflix? That was, so the guy that directed it is uh, Lockhart in um, Harry Potter. I can't remember his name, but he's like a director. He's, he also directed Oh, Thor. yeah. Uh, Kenneth Branagh. Yeah, yeah. He's That's amazing. The, I love him. But he did Artemis Fowl. He did, a, no, he did a bad job there, but I, I still love him so much. Hey, I, I liked like, his Agatha Christie um, Murder on the Orient Express. He's also doing Death on the Nile. No, yeah. Mur Murder on the Orient Express was like a surprise. You know, we have like a little dollar theater, you know, mm -hmm. that gets all the movies like six months later and back before COVID. You know, we just pop down there and just, oh, that looks interesting. So Mur Murder on the Orient Express is one of those. And I love that movie. Like, it, it's not a perfect movie, but it was so enjoyable. And I love Kenneth Branagh. And he's also really good in Much Ado About Nothing, which is from like forever ago in like the 80s. <laughs> it's oh. like a Shakespeare. I think, I'm not sure if he directed it, but I think he did. And it's so good. 
Yeah, yeah like there's, they all, I think the worst adaptation I've ever watched was actually the Circuit of Freak one because there was just everything about it was wrong. Like John C. Riley is supposed to be playing this badass vampire, but he, he no, he has like the <laughs> silly horrible. orange hair. It's like all over the place. I mean, Aragon's just boring, but that's because technology at that time was just so limited. Unfortunately, I think the rights are still like owned by one person. And he's just like, I'm never giving these up until they expire. Yeah, Aragon, I actually don't remember as being bad, but I was like 10 or 11 or something. I don't know how old I was. I was young enough where I was just like, this is cool. Like a book I read as a movie and I have not watched it ever since. I've watched it the one time. So, Did you ever watch the Wheel of Time, like the thing that they made like for a couple minutes? Because this company, I think a German company owned the rights for a couple seconds with Billy Zane. So... I'm going to be honest with you, like, I watched that probably like a two or three months ago because I finished Wheel of Time in the end of July, and I loved it. <laughs> like, I only loved it because it was just, it was some form of Wheel of Time on my screen, and just, just even hearing him run around his house that didn't look like anything from the Wheel of Time, and his weird suit that he's wearing, like, screaming Ilyana, and even though it was drawn out for like 15 minutes of him just running around screaming her name. I loved it. Like, I actually like Billy Zane. Just hearing those lines spoken was awesome. Like, so it's awful. I don't know if you've seen the Dusty Wheel cut that they did over at the Dusty not. Wheel. Yeah, on YouTube, the Dusty Wheel is a great channel. They cover like exclusively Wheel of Time. Um, but he's He did a cut of that and basically spruced it up, like cut it down a lot, switched some things around. It's still awful, but it's like, it's watchable now, and so it's pretty cool. So if anybody wants to go watch that, it's at the Dusty Wheel. Well, my favorite, like, guilty pleasure type of fantasy uh, story is actually Dungeons & Dragons with Jeremy Irons, because him as the villain of that is the most fun I've ever watched someone ham it up on screen as Protheon. So I've never seen that, but I know Jeremy Irons, wasn't he in Aragon? Wasn't yes, he... I think he was the villain of that one, too. No, wait, he, he was the good guy. He was the good guy. He was Brom. Brom, the... He was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The alleged stand-in for Obi-Wan Kenobi. I think Christopher Padalini will disagree with everyone that says it. No, that book is 100% A New Hope. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. It's 100%. I mean, to be fair, that was like written by like a 14-year-old. And it's weird yeah. because like I've talked about this Stranger Left the last time I did a conversation, but people don't realize how popular Aragon was. Like, I was in elementary school, and everyone knew that his name because, like, a 14-year-old kid got a book published, and it's, like, a bestseller? Like, that was a huge deal. I didn't even know it was written by a 14-year-old kid. Like, I just picked it up and read it, and, like, I didn't read... That was the first dragon fantasy I'd ever read. So, yeah, I never read any of these other series I can't really think about right now. Like, what's the... Um, What's the big one? The dragons and McCaffrey. Doesn't she do like a big series about dragons? Yeah. Yeah, she does. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but the one that I always think about is, uh, I can't remember the name of the series, but it's written by Naomi Novak. It's, I think it's like his majesty's dragon, but the reason why I love that series so much, was actually a fan fiction for master and commander of the movie. She just added dragons to it. And then sold it, and it's a really good series. Naomi Novik is such a fun author. She did Spinning Silver and Uprooted, and there's so much fun in those books. So can I take you off uh, subject real quick and ask you, so so as I said before, I didn't read fantasy for, or anything, for a really long time. Sorry, I'm looking for my pen. Um, and so you can see what I read pretty much behind me. Wheel of Time, all of Cosmere, you know, I've read... Uh, First Law, we'll, or we'll have soon. Dresden Files, I'm loving, but I'm not all the way through it, of course. So are there any other, like, must-reads? You know, obviously, I've read King Killer. So is there anything that you are like, you have to read this? And I'll tell you if I read it or not. And I can write it Ooh, down. Ooh, that's... Oh, man, you're putting me on the spot for this. Um, I I started reading Kings of the Wild, and I, I'm loving it so far. I recommend that's that a lot. That's how much you are. Other yeah. books that I'm recommending, like, to them... Hmm. I like the Black Prism by uh, Brent Weeks. That's a lot of fun. Dresden Files is uh, great. Um, a lot of the stuff by Jim Butcher too, like his Codex Alara series, is actually interesting. It's a Roman Pokemon. Is that good? 
it it has its peaks and valleys, but it's consistently yeah. good in many ways. Uh, one of my favorite books of all time is a George R. R. Martin book that people keep forgetting. It's Vampire Steamboat. The book it's called. Um, oh my gosh, what did I, I just forgot. Oh, Fever Dream. That's what it's called. So it's vampires on a steamboat, and it's. I'm surprised that was never adapted into a movie, because they did Night Flyers, which was okay. But I think it got canceled like before I even finished. Yeah, I've heard him talk about that in like interviews before. Like he's talking about he wants to write like sequels to that. Actually, I think. Um, so yeah, I'll put that one down for sure. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Some like out of the way because right now what I'm trying to do is like go through all the established great series so I can like have them under my belt, um, and then I can start going more out of off the beaten path and like, you know, I, like not a strategy, but like. For my channel, like I'm trying to go through like all the stuff, like yeah, like Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings and Stormlight and all these things that like everybody knows. They already know it's good. Like if I do a review, I'm not like saying anything that nobody's ever heard before. I'm just saying like, hey, here's what I think about it. But I do want to get to the point where I can like snatch a book up as soon as it comes out and like read that. But right now, I feel like I'm like bogged down in my TBR with trying to catch up to everybody else that's read everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, for me, like, I've been trying to switch over more towards, like, digital, like, ebooks because I just don't have enough room space anymore. And sometimes it's much easier to just buy a book that's on sale that way than it is to go to the store now and get it. Like, I've actually never read all of the Wheel of Time. I've only read the first three books, and it's something that's on my, my list to do. Maybe I might do it for my channel. Pandemic was perfect. Like, basically because, I mean, like I said, I was working, but your free time, there was nothing to go do. So I was like, screw it, I'll, I'll read Will of Time because Daniel Green says I should. And then uh, Mike's book reviews, like, I think he had, he was ahead of me by like a year, you know, but he wasn't done yet either. So I went back and each time I finished a book, I would watch his video of that book and just keep going. And so he kind of pulled me through it. But yeah, I read it in like five months, I think. And for me, I'm like, I'm not the fastest, fastest reader, but I read like all the time, but it was totally worth it. Like, like all the things that, it gets criticized for like being repetitive or just like having huge chunks of books that are like nothing's happening. Like they're true. But when I would go to these other series as like little breaks, like I'd be like a, a halfway through that book, even like a Dresden Files book or something. I'd just be like, okay, I just need to get through this thing because I've got to get back to the wheel of time. Like I would start to immediately miss all the things that were annoying me when I stopped. Like as soon as I got like halfway, like a hundred pages into another book, I'm like, man, this just isn't the wheel of time. See, I have so that really problem, is... too, where, like, sometimes you'll start a book and be like, I can't wait to get to the next book in this series. It's like you're already, like, mm -hmm. thinking ahead. It was kind of, like, screws up the reading a little bit because it makes it you does. enjoy it less a little bit. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, that, that's why, like, I was actually talking to somebody the other day about different forms because Daniel Green made a video about, like, how to read more, uh, a newer video, and he was talking about, you know, doing different mediums, like doing an audiobook, you know, doing an ebook and then having your physical cop or whatever and like changing where you read and all these different things. But, you know, I've started doing like eBooks for self-published books. So I'm like reading unsold right now by Will White. First That's book actually, I started series. reading that too, because they were all free recently. Like I'll give it a try. They were all free. And I'm like, okay, everybody's freaking out about winter steel. Like I've got to get and start catching up. They're really short. So I'm reading unsold on my, uh, on my phone, basically on Kindle app. And then I'm reading, you know, my physical books that I'm reading and then I've got an audio book for like things that aren't fantasy. So if I'm driving, I can try to consume some things outside of my normal, you know, stuff and like get a little bit of a palate cleanser from all the fantasy. So definitely like the different mediums definitely help break it up a little bit for sure. Yeah, no, most definitely, especially like when it comes to it, like when I read, like, it's weird. There's like so many books about sex positions, but there's not enough books about reading positions because I have such a hard time like sitting down and That's like hilarious. getting comfortable. <laughs> yeah. That might just be like a book that I make, like the Kamaritra or something. Yes. Please make that book. Like, Cause my, my biggest fear is always like when it comes to like a Brandon Sanderson book, it's like snapping my wrists in half with like, just like a paperback or just like figuring out how to read. Cause the, sometimes it hurts. I love it, but it hurts. Well, that's the good thing about these big, big ass versions is that they just flop. <laughs> And so you don't have to, like, I just, like, sit th sit it on my lap and the pages aren't going to start flopping away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're, they're heavy enough to where they weigh themselves down, but then you also just don't have to hold them. So 
I love the floppy paperback. Like that is the best, most enjoyable book to read. And just side tangent, I have to say, this is weird, but like for me, what a book looks like and feels like completely oh. can ruin the reading experience for me. Like I feel like I don't like Hearst Law as much because I have this edition and the paper feels like skin. Like it feels like leather or something. Like it's Well, horrible. to be fair, I think that's a Joe Amber Crombie thing. Like it needs to be a, a book made out of flesh. It is, but it's awful. Like I I am uncomfortable holding it. And like I feel like I would love it so much more if I had one of like the smooth white editions that don't have like the raised weird like I may do a video on that, like book covers that have ruined books for me or something. I don't know. I, I have something planned like that too. Like some of like the most misinformed book covers ever made for mm-hmm. like certain books because some of them could be really wacky. Though it's it's mm-hmm. weird because I don't want to like drag on like self published books, but whatever they use for like Amazon, like sometimes when I buy them, they have like this weird material that they use for the cover. That's like this almost like fake pleather or like this weird, like what you'd have like in a jewel box, which just feels mm-hmm. so weird to me. It kind of puts me off reading them. That's why I, I just get them as an ebook now. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's sad, but like the actual aesthetics of the way it looks, the way it feels, how big it is, like all this stuff goes into the enjoyment of a book. And like, I think I may like, disclaim when I do my first law review because I'm pretty sure it's not going to be the most positive thing ever unless this book just completely turns it around like hey I read an edition that was awful to read so this may be coloring my opinion because it's it's that drastic like the other thing too is like the wheel of times that I have are like just like it's a hand workout to open them and like my hands I thought I got like carpal tunnel from all the wheel of time reading I was doing because you have to like keep them pried open because they're so thick and squat well, I don't know if you have the ones that are the big floppy with the uh, ebook uh, art on the. No, covers. so actually the ones that I got, funny enough, I I go to a lot of like swap meets and I go to a lot of like yard sales and I went to a yard sale and someone was giving all the just they just throwing them all away for like ten bucks. So I got all the Wheel of Time books. What the heck? For ten bucks, I was like, okay, I guess wow. I'll I read these. Some of them are like really you know battered and bashed. That means someone really loved reading them, but I'll eventually replace those ones. But I have, I'm still, it's cheaper to have those ones than it would be to just go out right now and spend either a hundred or 200 bucks on the editions that you got. Yeah, no, it's, I, I looked at the editions that I really want long term. Like, I think it's the tour ones that are the uh, big floppy with the art, that the best art out of all of them. And I think they're like $23 a book and it's 15 bucks if you include the prequel and it's just, that's pretty prohibitively expensive, like, if you just don't have cash laying around. So maybe one day. Maybe one day. Or I'll just get, like, the $100 ebook that has them all together. Just the massive, massive word file. Oh, Jesus. Because <laughs> I got that for um, Mistborn, the Mistborn trilogy. And it's so weird to just click buy one book and be like, oh, man, this is this keeps going. I'm a thousand pages in. What, I'm only, like, 2% in? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... It's kind of what I was thinking with the Night Angel, but like when I looked at Night Angel, I was like, this is about as big as a Stormlight book. So if I just pretend it's one book, I can read it over like a week and a half and I'll have read an entire trilogy, which I think I'm going to read that before Lightbringer just to, because would you say that it's not as like polished or he's improved a lot in Lightbringer? So what I would say about uh, the Night Angel trilogy, and this is for anyone, this will probably be the review if I ever make it, which I will, is that it is a book that was designed for a 13 year old that thinks everything about anime and murder is cool. And it isn't the best, like, how it's written, but also it isn't the worst. Like, it's very, like, I remember the, there's some scenes that have stuck with me even to this day. Like, I'll be in, like, the grocery store. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's that one scene that I really, really like. Huh. And then go back to getting milk and stuff and just go off with my day. But I, I like them, you know, um, the Lightbringer series so much. It's, it, they're they're complete they're apples and oranges yeah bit. i was really happy today actually i was watching one of daniel's videos um i think he was talking about books that he had changed his mind on and one of them was lightbringer because i had heard that the didn't end very well and people hated the ending and i was like i was like super excited because at one point it was getting compared like stormlight versus it like you could say either one was better and then lightbringer finished and then it felt like everybody was kind of like went down on it and so I was just haven't picked up like I've have not read that book because I was 
bought it and was intending to read it. And then I heard that it didn't end well. So hearing that he changed his mind and that he thought it ended better now after like a year because it stayed with him the whole time was encouraging. And I do want to read it. So would you say that you like the ending of it? Uh, yeah. Cause the funny thing is, is so I read the majority of that book uh, last year. So when it came out, I was actually flying back from New York and I had like five hour flight. And I remember reading that whole book in one sitting and like, this is like the one time or there's multiple times. I think I've done this as well with like his dark materials, but getting like emotional and like looking around, everyone just bored out of their minds as pre COVID and just being like, why can't you feel how I feel? Cause I'm sad and depressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get that way with, that's with my girlfriend all the time. Like, I was reading like okay, The Broken Empire, which I I will disclaim here too is not a series for everyone. Uh, but I've finished the second book, and that book like like I I never cry. Like even if I try to cry, I can't cry. I don't know if that says anything about me. If that's bad or not, but a moistening of the eyes is equivalent to me of like weeping. And so like in that book, like yeah, it hit me like. And I was looking at my girlfriend and she's just smiling along, like watching some TV show. I'm like, why are you happy right now? Like, don't you understand what's happening? So I definitely understand that feeling for sure. Yeah, for me, like I'm kind of like an emotional person when it comes to like, it, it actually it's more like when it's things that I know that are like manipulating me in that way. I think every time that I read a Stormlight book and like the big Sandra Lanch moment happens, I'm just like, oh, here comes the tears. And yeah, do you feel like that works against it at all? Because I think in Oathbringer, maybe, and I will say I read all three of them back to back. So I think maybe by the time I got to Oathbringer, I was a little burnt out because it was just so much so quick. But I am going to reread Oathbringer starting beginning of November before Rhythm of War. So I'm hoping that that time and I can go back and like really get more out of it. Because that last scene, like I don't remember being like emotionally impacted by it. But then I listened to the graphic audio one day. It just popped up and I clicked on it where it's the you cannot have my pain moment. And dude, I was, I'm getting chills right now. Like, oh my God, I was hit so hard. And I was like, how did I not, how, do, how did that moment not stick with me over the last like few months? See, the way that I think about it, my brain works. I think of everything as movies. So like when I was reading that scene, like we're not spoiling anything, I guess. is like when it comes to it, when, I, when it happens, I was just like, this is awesome. Though... It wasn't the same type of emotional impact that I got while reading um, Words of Radiance with um, everyone's flying in the sky. Like that type of stuff. Like it's it's weird because when you think of like Brandon Sanderson, he, that's just a staple, the Sander Lanch. And now I'm really interested to see what's happening in Rhythm of War because he said, this is the scene that I've been thinking about for decades. This is like one of the first big scenes and one of my personal favorites. I'm like, it has to be really good then, right? Oh wait, so what? So I've I've seen allusions to this, and just disclaimer: I've not read any of the I'm Rhythm not, of not, War we're, chapters. We're not spoiling any of the of the chapters. But I'm just letting you know: I've not read any of Rhythm of War. I have no idea what's happening in the first fifteen chapters that have dropped so far. Like I'm waiting to get it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start it then. But there's been some event that people keep saying: What is this big event that Brandon keeps talking about in Rhythm of War that's supposed to happen? So have you heard that? Um, I've heard him talk about it, like, without spoiling anything for anyone, because I'm trying to keep away from, like, I've read them, but I'm trying to keep away from, like, talking about it, because I don't know who's read them and who isn't. There are, like, allusions to stuff, but I feel like those only go so far compared to, like, what the actual reveal is going to be, because when it comes to any Stormlight book, I've actually talked about it in my video in the huge event, there's always a huge battle scene that has some amazing moment into it, and then afterwards, near the end, there's, like, that huge moment where, like, reality just flips on its head may it be something in the first book where you get like a reality drop same as with the last book with the reality drop so i'm interested to see if is it going to be that or is it going to be like a huge action moment yeah the and again not spoiling anything but the the there is one moment in Northbringer that has stuck with me and you probably know what i'm talking about can you do it in like emojis <laughs> yeah well it's uh it is the reveal that is not an action scene. Okay. Where you have to look in a whole new light at everything. Oh, that's okay. So, so if far. I was to do this in emojis, it would be gaspy face and a yeah. head explosion, head explosion, fire and yeah. brimstone. Yeah, yeah. And that has just stuck with like, man, that was like that's the one that caught me off guard. That's the one where I actually got emotional 
because everything before that you didn't understand, you know, why this happened or whatever. And just knowing also how that event, especially changes one vision from Way of Kings, uh, the Day of Recreance, if you know what I'm talking about. So the actual implications of that, like everything that that did was just really phenomenal about Brandon. Like that hit me way harder than the stuff at the end with, you know, who. so anyway, it's so hard not to spoil stuff like just casually. Yeah, it's, it's it's hard, and it's one of those where, I mean, people are listening to this. Most most people that follow me, like Stormlight and stuff, like, okay, you could talk about it, but, like, what if it's the one person that doesn't, and I don't want to be that one jerk that accidentally, like, you know, spoils something. Like, oh, oh, no, I didn't mean it that way, yeah. Mom. Yeah, I don't, I don't watch movie trailers at all, hardly. Like, I watch the Dune one, but that's, like, a rare exception um, because I've already seen, like, the original movies with, like, my dad, but... You know, I usually don't watch anything like I don't want to know a literal line of dialogue that is said in a movie before I go watch it. See, my thing has changed because the moment that changed for me was The Last Jedi, where I was like really obsessed with like every minute detail. I think about the trailer that I watched the movie and I'm like, maybe it's better to not know much because then I can't overhype myself up for something. It's a okay movie, but I think I overhyped to the point of where... It just had impossible expectations. So now I kind of more like that when it comes to like, I'll, I'll see the first trailer or something and then just go out with my day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to break stuff down ahead of time because it just leads to disappointment. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. No, my favorite is what's going to happen with Ray and Kylo. Is she going to chop his uh, TIE fighter in half? I'm like, well, I, I'm going to take, I'm going to assume through, uh, reasoning that's probably what's going to happen when she jumps over with a lightsaber activated but what does it mean for the overall narrative clickbait yeah yeah no and yeah rise of skywalker yeah uh, we probably shouldn't go down that rabbit hole because i'll just trash it for so long. oh no i think that's you know talking about the rise of skywalker is a path that leads to powers that some might consider unnatural unnatural <laughs> yeah yeah last jedi the whole series trilogy now like you know, just really quick, like I am a fan of The Last Jedi, but I also do understand how that could completely have pissed people off. And so, you know, I think it's always important to embrace nuance as much as possible. Like two things can be true. Like you, somebody can like it and then somebody else can be pissed about it and they can both be correct. So, you know, but it is a hot topic. It's almost like politics at this point. Yeah, I try like, to not talk I just, about it. I do not bring it up to anybody ever. Like, I'm just like, this is just going to go badly. Yeah, no, there's something that I don't talk about anymore. Uh, politics, sports, religion, and Star Wars now. Because, you know, it's it's a minefield. And when it comes down to it, like, I love Star Wars. Star Wars is, like, for me, some of my earliest memories. Like, I don't think I was a Star Wars fan. Like, come to think of it, dressed up as Anakin in 1999, my earliest memory was watching A New Hope. I'm like, oh, God, I guess I am a Star Wars fan since birth. And yeah, things, yeah. Uh, I remember, like, for me, as a kid, it was Lion King that I played on repeat. And then once I grew out of that, the next thing was like the VHS little silver trilogy edition of all three Star Wars movies. And I just would loop them. And I would sit there and be like physically like rewinding like the little VHS with my finger <laughs> while I was like waiting, watching one of the other movies so I could just pop it right back in. See, that's funny because for me it was um, Revenge of the Sith. I remember I got it for Hanukkah. And I didn't even know that the original series existed. This is just me. I remember watching all the bonus features like, wait, there are other movies? Like, oh, that's, wow. I was like, that's like Christmas. Yeah. That's and awesome. Then I, and then afterwards, uh, Thanksgiving the next year, I got them all at Blockbuster. And I started. I watched them all while they were making turkey. So by the end of their doing like their yub nub, I'm like, okay, time for turkey. Nice. Yeah. No, I remember my cousins, like I have like nine cousins from one family. And I think at this time only like five of them existed. But they, I remember like Star Wars being like our connecting thing. You know, whenever we saw each other, we would just sit down and like watch all six in a row, and then we would go get all the plastic lightsabers and just beat the crap out of each other in the backyard. <laughs> like, so much fun. I love Star Wars, and like, no, nothing that they ever do will not make me like Star Wars, you know? See, like, Star Wars for me is like a reunion. That's when I get to hang out with my friends and we nerd yeah. out for, for a while. The movie might not be good or might be great, but at the end of the day, we just love hanging out. I stayed. 14 hours in line to see The Force Awakens because I was hanging out with my friends and we were having a good time. Yeah. And that was, it was a fun movie. Like, 
And another thing I'll say too is like for people who get really upset when like let's say like name the wind and like we haven't got the third book and you're getting upset the author or if it's winds of winter or what have you like you can appreciate name of the wind just as its own piece of art or something that you enjoy you know and you don't have to have a conclusion i understand if you want it but like and we don't have to let bad endings ruin good books either you know i was just talking to somebody on reddit about uh shit, what was it some kind of blood raven trilogy i don't remember Bloodborne is like, they're like, that's one of the best books ever. But then the next two books came out and were just terrible. And they're like, don't, don't read it because, you know, it's like the first season of Game of Thrones versus the last one. And I'm like, if it's a, one of the best books ever, I'm going to read it. I don't care what the ending is. I don't have to read those books. I can still enjoy it by itself, you know? And also, I think when it comes to what people kind of forget about is that it's like this weird thing where people are like, you have to like it or you have to hate it rather than a person forming their own opinion about it because some people might find things more interesting in the things you don't find interesting and, you know, vice versa. And that's something like, especially like letting people make their own decisions when it comes to that informing, especially when it comes to book stuff because books and art and music is subjective. Like, it's weird. Like, I went from listening to like MCR and a bunch of like nerdy emo bands to like listening to less like 90s hip hop now and stuff. And I'm like, things change after a while. Yeah, what do you, I mean, what do you think about, um, you know, obviously if you review books and things like you want there to be conversation generated around a review. If you like, if you not necessarily trashing a book, but if you like, if you didn't like something, you kind of want somebody to come back and be like, well, here's why it's good. And then it can kind of generate conversation. If, if everything is just constantly like, well, I see your point, but here's my point. And then if it becomes too civil, I almost think that's boring. So like, I don't mind people being passionate and I really encourage people to like, if you wanted to defend something that you love, like we can all just realize at the end of the day, like we all have our different tastes. But at the same time, we can also have fun generating conversation. Like, I don't want to say by any means, like people shouldn't have opinions and shouldn't share them because that's what's fun about this whole thing is like, we get to share why we like something and you may end up changing somebody's mind or if you don't it's fine it's just like when it gets too personal and people are like you're stupid because you don't like this or because you do like this that's when it just gets to annoying but we should still be disagreeing with each other so my philosophy has always been when it comes to like reviews is like review the book that you have not the book you wish you had kind of like you have to like review it and like kind of not do like the armchair thing of like, well, this is how I would do the book if I wrote it. And then you start writing a book like, wow, this is this is really hard, though. Like you said, I think having those types of, you know, conversations with people within the comments, because, you know, you do have like the jerks. You do have the people that want to be helpful. And it's like being able to pick and choose through those and try to make conversation meaningful rather than just like people berating each other about things that aren't between the material, because Sometimes you might get it from a certain point of view, if we're going to use more Star Wars stuff, someone might find like, well, this, I found this to be interesting. And you never thought of it that way. And then maybe you might have to reevaluate your own opinion or own review of the material because someone, because you're like thinking of it in one way and someone's thinking about it in another way. It could add to like meaningful conversation. And that's something that when it comes down to it, as long as people aren't like berating each other and just not being cool. I, I love having interactions with people. Yeah, same. I mean, like, and even on, like, I would say a more base example, like, I'm a huge sports fan. Um, and sports, like, between different fan bases, especially, if, you know, if the team you support is competing against a team in the playoffs or somewhere, it's a high stakes situation. Like, yeah, there's gonna be some trash talk. Like, I'm gonna talk to a bunch of smack. And I may even say, like, your player sucks and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, if, like, if that team beats the team that I support, I'm gonna be real and be like, okay, you that was awesome like y'all are y'all are great like good luck on the next round like it's yeah it's all it's all like it's all in good nature like it's all in good fun like at the end of the day you're just supporting what you love but then you know and i've had people change my opinions on things like it's okay like what is the downer says like a hypocrite is just a person that's in the process of changing like yeah like if you change your opinion doesn't mean you're a hypocrite it just means that you see something in new light and you change your mind. You're allowed to do that. You know? Well, yeah. And it's something like, you know, well, I was not going to spoil anything, but the, you know, sometimes the next step is kind of like figuring out how you can become better. 
when it comes to like, you know, you and trying to find like things to change. And I find that to be, especially with books and doing YouTube and like engaging with people within the fantasy community in a way of like, I don't talk to people in real life about fantasy stuff because I'll talk to some of my best friends and their eyes will glaze over. But when you talk to people online, like it's very like, you know, you know, and anyone, anyone can say anything. Everyone has like a, a platform they can talk about. And it's interesting, like when it comes to that, because you can, I, hey, there have been opinions that have completely changed and for me and like, oh, maybe the series I should reevaluate it or maybe this series I looked past it a little bit. So let me read it and take my time. And that's something that that's a beautiful thing. We're growing and changing and adapting to help suit ourselves as well as the same time creating content that's just fun that makes people happy. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I almost wonder, like, just just. Would I prefer it if every single person was a fan of fantasy and sci-fi and all this stuff? Or would I prefer it if we were still pretty niche like we are now? Like, I don't know anybody in my actual real life that, like, I, I think I know, like, two people that are, like, friends to quasi-friends. Like, I don't have any, like, deep personal relationships with people in my actual real life, which, like I said, I'm kind of an introvert, so that's okay. But that actually care about fantasy and things like that in terms of books. Um, so I almost don't know if I would rather if everybody did it or would I feel like, oh man, now I don't have like a thing that's just my own or would I prefer it just to be as now? Because like you said, right now we're talking, but it has to be through technology because we're so spread out as a community that it's hard to find people unless you go to like a convention or something or a bookstore and you just happen to see somebody and you want to start a conversation. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's happened to me before where, like, sometimes I'll pick out books and have conversations with people next to me. And then there's been other times where, like, I got a copy of The Name of the Wind for someone and the store clerk tried to talk me down off of it because it wasn't done yet. So, you know, you have those conversations. I'm like, this is a hostage negotiation? No, I want the book. Well, the, uh, you know, I almost, I do wish that we were, it was a bigger community just because, like, this is a really weird reason, but every time I meet somebody who does like fantasy and like, I remember it was a guy that is a friend of my girlfriend's friend or whatever. We were like hanging out and playing Catan, I think. And he's like, yeah, something, something like, I think I saw a copy of like Liza Lockamore on her stuff. I was like, oh, you like Jim Ambassador? He's like, oh yeah. And then we started talking about like Mistborn. And I feel like I got like fanboyish with a non-celebrity person. And it was just like, gushing about all this stuff and i was like why am i being this way it's because it's like pent up conversation that you don't get to have in real life and so like when you do you just become like completely manic and weird and i just wish it was more normal to get it out yeah and that's something like for me that's like the the most fun especially when you find that one person you can connect to in real life like oh my god i can talk about this like for me i'm a theme park person and sometimes i'll go to theme park events and just talk about things that no one cares about that are so obscure with someone that understands like, wow, you, you, you like this old, old event from like the eighties. Yeah, me too. And like, we start talking about it. Like no one, no one cares, but for that moment, you both are just connecting in like a, almost like a primal level where you're just enjoying the two things and being able to like really geek out and have fun. It's super special. Like when you do find that, like it's very rare, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of having like an evolving conversation here with myself, I guess. But I do think that I, I, I do like how that is, you know, it's nice when things like Game of Thrones become widespread and you can talk about it. But at the same time, it's like you do lose a little something when this tight knit community, you know, becomes so large that it gets kind of diluted with people who haven't necessarily read the books or whatever. And like, i Fully support that but i do think there's something lost like some kind of magic that's lost in this community that was just everybody's a reader and all that kind of thing and then like when wheel of time tv show comes out and if it's successful like i think there is some fear in the wheel of time community that like and i'm not saying it's good fear but i think it's there that like people are worried that like oh no the fake fans are going to come but it's like no i mean it's, it's still good to have it be out there and hopefully it inspires people to read the books and if they don't want to, that's fine too. But, you know, I do just, I do love the connection that you make with someone who just loves something that you love. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like when it comes to like getting new fans for like a new property or anything, it's actually, I look at it as a, also like a blessing and a curse when it comes to the blessing part. I always like to talk about the good is you're getting new people that might connect to the material a lot differently than, 
you know, people that have read it like a thousand times, and now you're seeing it through the eyes of someone, which, I mean, I used to watch Star Wars with people that never watched Star Wars and just watch their reactions and have fun. I mean, the bad is, like, you get, like, those people that are, like, super, like, you, you know, oh, God, they're, like, they're jerks, or, like, they, like, they're, like, I've been here from the beginning. When was the first time you read a book? Three months ago. Like, okay. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you have like those gatekeeping, people. basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it, except, like, it's, like, ultra gatekeeping sometimes, too, especially where it comes, you know, a, a gate opens two ways where some people that are, like, really hold on to a property might be fearful to let new people in and vice versa. So it's, like, it's, it's interesting, especially the Wheel of Time community where they're some of the nicest people ever. Like, you'll just type something about Wheel of Time and you'll just get, like, a thousand messages and, like, how did you even find me? We're not even following each other. And, like, they're all No, yeah, Wheel of Time there. is, like, the best community. Like... All through Reddit, like in Reddit, you know, you go and you can basically just talk about, you know, tag your spoiler for whatever book you're on. And like, such nice people, man. I just have to say, like, they were so welcoming and just like, very careful to not spoil anything. And like, the only thing that was spoiled for me in the entire series, I spoiled for myself on accident. I just wanted to see some freaking art of the Emmonsfield boys and had something like some fan art piece that I shouldn't have not been on Google and it spoiled something a visual aspect for me and I'm just like damn this is why you turn safe search on (laughs) yeah I mean I don't know how I did that to myself but it wasn't even a big thing like I just hate it so much so yeah it's it is what it is sometimes it's it is yeah, like, um, I'm trying to get through it, and that's, like, one of the weird things, especially when it comes to Wheel of Time, like, I want to be a part of the community, but because I haven't read most of the books, I, I feel like I can't, because then I'll get spoiled by something, which is, like, the only time that really happens, I feel like, unless it's big series. I think that's why I pushed through it, like, I easily could have read it over a year instead, but I wanted to be able to just talk openly and freely without fear, and, like, I was, like, a nervous wreck sometimes, like, like hiding the screen behind my hand, like trying to go line by line and not hit a spoiler because there's just so much like the story is so epic and you know, it's good. You know, the ending's supposed to be good and you just don't want any moment like taken from you because it'll just kill your enjoyment. So when you're on like book four and five and like the first half of the series, it's especially bad um, because you got so much further to go. Once you get a little later in the series, like it's a little easier, but if you only been through book three so far, like, yeah. Yeah, caution, it's man. caution. It, it's caution to the wind. Like I don't, I have a hard time, especially like when it comes to names. So I'm like having to like, I have to type in non-spoiler, really non-spoiler character guides for people, and I like, I, I still do it like, uh, yeah, just just in case. So, so what do you think of the first three books so far? Uh, the first book I tried reading five times and I couldn't get past the prose, but then after a while of like reading older fantasy books. I started to get into it. I read um, The Great Hunt in three sittings because I really enjoyed that when it, like, the actually, like, when, you know, becomes more traditional fantasy stuff. In the third book, I was just loving it until the end. I just haven't had a chance to read more of them. It's on my list. It's it's great because if I remember quickly, the Amazon show is the first two books, the first season, I think. Yeah, I don't know if they've actually announced it. Like, I think it may be, like, the prequel. Or, like, it's the first book with maybe some flashbacks of the prequel with maybe a little bit of season or of book two thrown in, but I don't think maybe the full thing. But it could be both. I mean, it's kind of all speculation right now. But yeah. But two it, books in one season is going to be hard to do. I'm just going to be honest with you. Yeah, we'll be interested to see how that's going to go because it's 14 books and you got to hopefully these kids don't age up all the way. Hi, I'm, I'm Rand and I'm now 35. Hey, guys, <laughs> I'm supposed to be 15 year old boy here my beard well i think they chose good actors that have very uh timeless faces which is really good for the eyes to die with their ageless face so um yeah i think it'll be okay to age up a little bit like rand probably needs to age up a little bit as he goes through the series but yeah it, it's just that's four episodes per book and they're only an hour long like i don't know if we were doing an hour and a half long episodes each i would say maybe but see that's like series unfortunate events where it went from, okay, one episode's going to be a book to two episodes per book where it felt like it was dragging a little bit. And I'm like, you could, you could probably make this into one episode and go on at times. But I, I liked it. Like, some of them were, like, full-on movies. And I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe this is going to be over. I'm going to have no more. I'm like, wait a second. There's, like, an entire season left. 
So we'll we'll see when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they're gonna do a good job. Everything I've heard, like the only thing I'm scared of is the one thing that Brandon said that fans were probably not gonna be happy with as far as a change that they made, and that he tried to talk Rafe Judkins out of it, and he was unsuccessful. So he's like, it's a it's his adaptation, like it's another turning of the wheel. Like you can't think of it as, you know, word for word the books. But I mean, I think I'll be fine with whatever it is. It's just like, it depends on what we're talking about. Like, is it a side character dying that didn't die? Or is it like a main character dying like in the first season or something? What are we, what are we talking about here, Brandon? But you won't say, so. Well, um, thank you so much, Chase, for coming on the show. I really appreciate yeah. it. It was a lot this of fun. was a lot of fun. Um, where can they find your YouTube channel? Where can they find you on social media? Yeah, you can find my YouTube channel. It's just called Fantasy Talk. It's a little orange circle with my face in it. If you want to click that one, because I think there is another fantasy talk that's like a sports channel. Uh, so don't click on that one. Or you can if you want to. It's free country. <laughs> um, and then Twitter is at fantasy talk with an underscore because somebody else had already taken the other one. And you can follow me on Goodreads, too. That's on my YouTube profile. I'll be getting an Instagram pretty soon. I don't really know how Instagram works, but I want to take pictures of my books, I guess, and post them. So follow me on all these things. It was really great talking to you, Zach. I really like your channel. Oh, um, thank you still getting caught up on all your videos but i did watch your high versus low fantasy one today so it was really good stuff and hopefully we both get some new people coming to our channels from this yeah that's all oh, here here we're all in this together it ain't a competition whatsoever we just want to talk about magic and wizards with guns <laughs> yeah well we talked about the will of time community being awesome and the booktube community is like just as awesome the support that people give each other it's really cool yeah it's it's wonderful and i, I love it so if you want to find me on social media, you can find me at Suda41, that's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to subscribe to this channel, I'm going to be having more conversations with people within the fantasy community, and we're just going to keep doing what we're doing here, just having conversations just about the things that we love. And like always, everyone, may your food and drink ever be tasteful, and may your books be filled with fancy and adventure. Bye, everyone. See ya. See ya.